Welcome everybody. First, some quick logistics, if you could silence your cell phones. If you'd notice the restroom on the way in, it's out there and to your left. There's food for all, as well as water. As you just heard, there's Spanish and Russian translation. So if you need a headset, please grab that. And we are on television, public access TV. So for anybody presenting, if you don't want to be on TV, stand outside of this line and that line. It will make for awkward television, but maybe that's more comfortable for you. So I'd like to welcome you all tonight. My notes here, my name is Stephen Joyner. I didn't need the notes for that. I am the chair of the Citizen Involvement Committee. Thank you for coming. The CIC, to give you a bit of background, the mission is to work with county officials and community to facilitate and enhance opportunities for citizen participation and input into decision making. Formed in 1984, it's a 15-member panel of volunteers. We are supported by and work with the Office of Citizen Involvement, which is represented back there with Kathleen Todd and Rob Wolfson. Some examples of what we've been working on, we have a Citizen Budget Advisory Committee group, we have budget forums, we have departmental reviews, we have live recruitment campaigns, we have diversity outreach work, and we have topical forums like this. And if you're thinking to yourself, that sounds far too exciting to possibly miss out on, you're right. If you are interested in the Citizen Involvement Committee, you're welcome to talk to myself, anybody wearing one of those gray badges who are all members of the CIC, I'll call them out later, or Rob or Kathleen. The structure of tonight, I want to stress that there is not going to be sign-ups for three-minute testimony. This is an update on two very important, uh, on the, the county's role in two very important initiatives, one being the health care and the other being the early childhood development. So the structure of the evening is going to go like this. <clears throat> for the first half hour, you're going to hear about the state's new early education, sorry, early child initiative. The next 50 minutes after that is dedicated to presentations about the county health care programs and how the new coordinated care organizations will operate as well as the new insurance marketplace and how to apply to participate. The last 35 minutes to explain all of the posters and things on the walls is set aside for you to provide your input and your feedback. We'll explain how that works. If you're curious about the post-its you have, that's for that process and know the colors don't matter for the post-its. There will also be short Q&A after the early childhood, early child and healthcare presentations, and we encourage you to ask your questions as well of the presenters during the gallery walk. They'll be here for that. I am very, very happy to step out of the limelight now by introducing Multnomah County Chair Jeff Kogan to make some remarks about the forum. Chair Kogan. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. You know, we hear a lot about apathy and people feeling disengaged from government, and it's very heartening for me to see so many folks out on a Wednesday night really just here to talk about some really important governmental initiatives in our community. And that's what this is really about, because the two things that we're going to talk about tonight are things going to make a very big difference in our quality of life locally. And it's the kind of thing that makes a big difference to have engaged community, and it makes a big difference to have folks who are informed and know what we're talking about. And both of the things we're talking about are initiatives that come from the state, that they really are driven by our governor, John Kitzhaber. And they're things that really are areas that matter tremendously, that frankly need a lot of work. And in both cases, in terms of the healthcare transformation and the early childhood reforms that the governor's pr producing, Multnomah County is a partner and an enthusiastic participant in these reforms, but this is not a Multnomah County effort. This is much broader than that. These are reforms that are going around across the state of Oregon, and in both cases, these are reforms that are deeply dependent on the engagement of the community. So the fact that you're out here today talking with us, learning about it, really, really helps. So thank you very much for taking time out of your busy lives. I wanna thank the Citizens Involvement Committee and Kathleen and Rob and everyone for putting this on. And I wanna thank all of you for being here with us. We're gonna hear from some experts in the field who really can answer questions and can tell us what we're doing, but we wanna hear from you. A really important part of this evening is gonna be the dialogue, is gonna be the engagement. So let us know what's important. And thanks again for coming out. That's all I've gotta say. I'm gonna turn it back to you, Steve. Thanks.
When facilitating an event, it's important to make sure you know how to say everybody's name. And I, of course, looked at my schedule and realized there's only one name on here that I don't know how to say for sure. And of course, it's the first person. So I'm going to guess it's Jada Rupley. Close? Far? What would be? Jada? And your last name? Rupley got that part right. Excellent. 50%. Introduce Jada Rupley, who's going to uh, give us an overview of the Early Childhood Initiative and the HUD report. She was appointed by Governor Kitzhaber to be the state's Early Learning Systems Director. With that, Jada, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> It'll make a bad television, but you're welcome to. And these mics are also on. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanne, for helping me with this. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jada Rupley, and as you heard, I am Governor Kitzhaber's Director of the Early Learning System. And I think that uh, in the last six months since I've been here in September, I have learned many things about the state of Oregon. And I lived for most of my life very close to Multnomah County because I was just north of the river. And I've always admired many of the community efforts that you all have done. And we, I am here tonight to talk a little bit about the state of Oregon, what we're looking at, and to once again ask you to roll up your sleeves and help with our youngest children, the future citizens of Oregon. So let me talk to you a little bit about what we have. There is a council that was appointed by Governor Kitzhaber, and that council is designed to look at the many programs in early learning. And in that look at what we're doing, we've had several pieces of legislation that are guiding us also along the way to do. And the very first one is Senate Bill House Bill, or Senate Bill House Bill 909, and it created the Early Learning Council. And the Early Learning Council has 18 members on it, and they are designed from the health care system to the Head Start to the communities out in rural areas as well as the um, state superintendent serves on the committee and the idea is is that we're looking at how we can help children be ready for kindergarten and that doesn't start the summer before it's time to enter kindergarten. It starts back when we have children born and so you all know that we know that. Lillian can talk to you about some of the transformation that has happened so that we make sure that we have healthy children because healthy children are very, very important to be ready for kindergarten. So we've invested, our governor has invested several resources into the state general fund for early learning, about $32 million additional to be able to look at money for children before they get to school. The idea is, is that we know when kids come ready for kindergarten, that means they also are reading in third grade, and it also means that they're ready to go into middle school. It means they're going to be successful in high school, and they're going to graduate. So we all have a same goal in mind with our kids. What was very, very exciting is at the same time all of these, oh, all of these initiatives, I did actually do that. <laughs> all of these initiatives that are happening at the state level um, cost a lot of money, and yeah, they're difficult to implement in some of the budget times that we have. So Oregon won a race to the top grant, which is one of the very coveted grants that come from the federal government to look at how a state can work with all of its communities to be able to make its children healthy and ready for kindergarten. So we received a $20 million grant, and there are a number of things, go ahead and you can move Joanne, that we need to look at. One is we need to ensure that all children are ready for kindergarten, they're ready to read in first grade, and they're reading at third grade level in third grade. And I'm gonna tell you something about children and reading. It isn't all just about reading, but what happens is in the first three grades, children learn to read so that for the rest of school, they read to learn. And that's why it's so, so important that we do that. Because one of the things that we know is that children who are not ready to read at third grade often have trouble in school. 
they end up in all those other systems that you've been a part of listening, um, and that if we don't get it right in these early years, it costs so much more later on. And what we also know, and you know, is that children who are raised in stable and attached families are healthy and happy, and so those are the things that we also wanna do. Foster care saves lives, but isn't it better if kids are all together with their children and, or their sisters and their brothers and they're in a family? So an attached, healthy family is one of those very important things also. And then what we know is there are many, many services that serve young children. And so if we can integrate these services and these systems better together, will we not be able to serve more kids and families? So this is what the um, Oregon early learning system will look like. We're on a bus and it looks like we're going kind of fast, huh? Um, it's early intervention. It's the first thousand days of life. So we start with kids that are young babies with their moms. We know that we need to have a quality environment for all children and that's not gonna look the same for every child. This is not a cookie cutter approach. Um, I might wanna use my neighbors to be able to watch my children while I go to work. I may be in a Head Start program. I may be working with my local school. We may do any number of things, and that's the idea, is this, this is about families choosing what's best for them. And then again, we have to look at that pre-kindergarten ready and third grade reading. How is that gonna look? In those Senate bills and the House bills that you heard, there was an Oregon Education Investment Board created. The governor said, I need to put things together because I have too many systems at the state level. And so they created the Oregon Education Investment Board. There's an early learning council working with those programs, birth to six, and the Head Start Act. There's a Youth Development Council that will be working with those six in those outside of school supports. And then if you look at the K-12 system, it's the school system and the school districts, so the State Board of Education. The connection to healthcare, like I talked about earlier, is very, critical time, and if you look at the early learning system, we're this bridge in the middle of two giants. We're in the middle of healthcare as one giant, and we're at the K-12 on the other end, so we work with pediatricians, we work with healthcare providers, we work with local health departments. All of those kinds of things are things that we wanna make sure that kids and families are able to access, whether it's immunizations that they need, any kind of early support, speech, language, physical therapy, any of those kinds of things, as well as looking at housing, um, all of those things that make a family stable. How are we gonna do that? We have several different initiatives with the Race to the Top grant. Um, but what I want to point out is this is really easy to think about. We've heard a lot of hub stories and hubbubs and how does that look. What we from the state level talked about is that we want to have tight outcomes because we want kids to be successful, we want kids to be ready for kindergarten. And we have implemented starting in September a kindergarten readiness assessment that all children in Oregon will take within the first six weeks. It's not to exclude children from school. That is not what we want to do. We want to take that serious snapshot and that look right then. What do kids know? What do they need to know? What can we do at that point? Because the first time really that kids get an assessment currently is at second grade. So that means they've spent almost three years in school and it's a little bit too late to be able to figure out. So this is really more, if you think about it, it's a, it's a really quick screening. It doesn't take long at all. It's gonna be done by the kindergarten teachers in their rooms. And then it's like, okay, what do we need to do to be successful moving forward? At the same time, it's a great look back to say where were these children and what did they know? How successful have they been? And what can we do to help maybe um, provide a little extra support 
in various ways. And that's really how the cub comes into play, is if you look at it, we have a universal screen, finding the kids, doing what we call an ages and stages. It's a really quick screen. You might get it in the library. You might have it from the health department. Your doctor might do it. It's a really quick one going, hey, here we have the temperature of what this child has at this point. The next step is to work with families to identify what they need. They may need nothing. They may need to just say, okay, everything's fine. We're moving forward. And then we need to link them with those services that they best need, and we have to be accountable for that. There's a lot of money that we're spending. We looked at a comprehensive children's budget for the state of Oregon, almost a billion dollars go into services for children birth to six. So we need to make sure that those are, are accountable outcomes that we have. How are we gonna do that? We are not gonna do that by me walking into this room and going, hi, I'm here from Salem and I think I've got an answer for you. We actually are looking at how we take communities and for the families in the programs of Multnomah County and how is it that you figure out what are the best way to serve the children from Multnomah County. We want to make sure from our perspective that services are aligned at our state level and at the community level. We wanna focus on those children at highest risk. We want to look at tracking outcomes from all levels. So I have not met yet a program that didn't have the best interests at heart. What we really need to know is do we deliver what we think we are? We need to measure those kinds of things. And then what we do is how does that look? How does that look here? How does it look in other parts, other communities? So what they, ELC did is they adopted a report, submitted it to the legislature. It's long, it's got lots of addendums and things like that, but really what it's about is what kind of work is gonna be done out in the communities, whether I live in Pendleton, whether I live in Central Oregon, whether I live in Multnomah, Clackamas, Washington counties, what is it that we're gonna do? How are we gonna connect to our schools? How are we gonna work with healthy children? How are we gonna do any number of things? Right now, the legislature is looking at how is it that we do home visiting? How is it that we provide quality environments? How is it that um, the Head Start will be at the table with us? So I think all of those kinds of things, what we're gonna say is, these are the things we want you to have in these future discussions, probably for the next six months. So these are gonna be hard discussions. Joanne was part of a work group that helped design some of that, and I think that People volunteer their time all the time and they work on committees together, but this was really about how is it that we're gonna make some of these hard decisions and how is it that we are going to be able to make sure that we address the needs of kids and families. So, from our perspective, we're looking at consolidation. We've done that. We've eliminated several different things. We wanna make sure that the connection happens to healthcare and the K-12 system. Remember, we're gonna walk in the doors of kindergarten. Community-based coordinators of early learning services. You can see why you shortened that name to hubs because you can't say it very many times. The idea might be is that there would be a person, there might be a place, there might be whatever you decide, there may be multiple people and multiple agencies that are serving as those community-based coordinators looking to see what services are available. And then what I said is the kindergarten readiness assessment goes into place. And one other element that I think is really important with our Race to the Top grant is we have a quality rating and improvement center. Um, what that is is it's a system for licensed childcare to be able to do a number of things. How many have um, a clear idea of how you're gonna choose childcare for your children? Raise your hand. Are you gonna look for an environment that you know would be much like it would be at home and um, a center or a home that will have similar values um, and ideas and that you would know that there's learning going on? 
So what we're trying to develop is a system that's easy for parents. Basically, you might think, okay, so if I'm gonna go to a hotel or if I'm gonna go to a restaurant, I'm gonna look at a five-star restaurant or four-star restaurant. So what you'll know in, in probably the next 18 to months to two years is that if you see a five-star rating, this provider has done several different things to make sure that all of the programs that they offer are the highest quality or if you have a three star, what you'll know is these are the kinds of things that you can expect to be able to see within this setting to be able to do for licensed childcare. It also is gonna provide coaching and it's also gonna look at being able to have training, not only with other child care providers, we're going to look at technology, also to train with kindergarten teachers so that we have that full spectrum in mind in terms of maybe this is what we do when we have three-year-olds, but this is what we do when we have five-year-olds and we want to make sure that we're all headed along the same way. So the TQRS is going to be something that you're going to see soon to be there. And this is the council. We also have, for those of you that um, want to join that early learning conversation, there's a um, connection up there. But what I'd really like to do is, Joanne, are you going to talk first, or should we do some questions? Or OK, so what I would really like to do is, I've gotten to the point where I do this all the time, and I think probably some of those things aren't confusing, so I'd love to ask questions. Yes, ma'am. RIS um, system. I thought it was voluntary. It is. Okay. It is. That was my understanding. Thank you. In choosing a child care provider by the ratings, how does it factor in that if um, a person and too many of us uh, can't afford a five star or a four star? We have to take the cheapest one that's closest to our house. I'm actually hoping that, and just like one of the things I did want to clarify is that we want to be able to make sure that we have the care that are closest to either our home or to our work or to our school. And so the idea is, is that we want to make sure that all participate um, in some way, shape, or form. And so while it is voluntary, you'll see an increase in training. You'll see a lot of things. So I don't know that a five-star is always going to be the most expensive because I think what we want to make sure is, is it's the highest quality. But I don't know that I would say that it's also going to be the highest cost. You know today we have various places that cost more money and we have those that cost less money, that, that that does not necessarily mean that the one that costs less money is less quality. So what we really want to do is figure out a way to work on the quality environments for kids. And I think that if I had an answer to be able to address the cost of childcare, that we could figure out a way to do that, I would be a national expert and not just one in the state of Oregon because it's always one of those struggles to have. And I know that some parents pay more for their childcare than they do for their mortgages. And that's just a system that still has, it had still not had an answer come for it yet. Yes, ma'am. Oh, hi. So um, I'm coming from an um, early Head Start and a Head Start. I'm a mom and I'm also on policy council. So I'm getting like both ends. And so I may be kind of um, jumping ahead. But when you're talking about, um, you know, integrating with the health system and um, the early learning system, so in, in kind of going to her question for the daycare. So where does, because um, I know the, the, <laughs> the cuts are coming. Where is the state? What level is the state? Where are they at in all this? Because I know that the, the cuts are going to be in federal, but where is the state? I mean, because something's going to have to give as far as the child care. We can't all afford five star. But for me, five star isn't important to my child. It's, um, it's, it's the environment. But it's also um, it's what's being instilled in you know there is it you know what what type of um, 
what type of um, what's what's being integrated? What's what is the child learning? You know, are they going to be at that kindergarten? Um, stage? Are they going to be ready to read at third grade? And that's what we're getting from Head Start. But if that is being cut, that daycares don't always provide that. You're right. Um, Head Start has, when, has been around for a long, long time, and they've actually, um, over the years, improved the kinds of work that they've done. They're full service, meaning that you've got the health, you've got all elements for children and for you as family. And thanks for serving on that policy council, because that's hard work, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, what we'd really like to see is all the good qualities that um, Head Starts have provided forever to be able to somehow be one of the things that we look at. So if we were to say, gee, how could we make every home and every center Head Start-like in terms of the quality elements they provide? Because what we know is out of 100,000 children that we have, only 14,000 slots are available for children um, that are eligible. So one of the hopes, um, while you talk about the cuts at the federal level, at the same time, remember our president had pretty exciting conversation in his State of the Union talking about the, the work that they're gonna do to increase um, those slots. We are hoping by the conversations and the work that you're gonna be doing here with looking at community-based coordination that we will be in Oregon sitting ready to take the first check that the federal government offers. Uh, and that's the idea because we've already taken $20 million and we're kind of hoping that we can have more of that. So that's kind of the idea is that we can, we, and frankly, the one thing I do want to say is remember I did say that the governor did um, put money into the state budget. And we actually, as the state of Oregon, more than match the dollars that come from Head Start. So we have more slots that are state-funded slots than there are federal. So we're doing our work and we need to do more. Yes. Hi, yes, I had a question on um, this program, a daycare program. Is there any plan or anything in place, um, as you know, parents are the first teachers to their kids? Being an the best in the teachers, area. Um, most important is, teacher. Absolutely. Is there any plan to have programs available to build capacity among parents to be there? You know, to um, to be there, the the first teachers for their kids. Uh, you know, in terms of having resources and tools in place that they can take on. Sometimes they don't have that access to that information. But is there any kind of programs in place to, to make that available to, to parents? To actually work with families to be able to look at how they can work with their own children. Yes, yes. Those are things that we're looking at. Um, number of things are offered right now. And Joanne might talk about some of the things that are already available. And you may know more of what's in Multnomah County. But I do know that there are home visits that you can come in, leave activities to do that. Hopefully, we're going to see more work with libraries and read and plays, play and learns, all of those kinds of things, because that's true. You are the first teacher, you're the middle teacher, you're going to be with them, and you're, I have a 33-year-old, and I'm still her best teacher. So. so as a quick point of clarity, excuse me, you notice on your agenda that we also have Charles McGee, he was unable to make it tonight. And I want to just point out, this is Joanne Fuller, who's the Chief Operating Officer for Multnomah County, and is very involved in the local implementation of both this program and the healthcare transformation. And again, everybody will be available during the gallery walk to continue to answer questions. So if you have specific questions to Multnomah County work in this, Joanne is definitely the person. Do you I actually think that? that makes a really nice transition to be able to look at doing. So I'm, I'm going to hang around, so I will be here for any questions, too. Great. Is that all right? Charles skipped out on it. Um, I don't have much to add to what Jada was saying, except for to say that we're going to need the participation of our community in the development of these services locally. Um, some of the services that Jada was talking about are currently coming through to our community. You would know them both as um, some of our early um, um, I'm being told to stand in the middle. Um, some of our um, some of our nurse home visiting programs, some of our other um, 
prenatal and early childhood outreach programs. We use some of these funding streams that Jada's talking about in our SUN system to fund our PCDS program, our, our parent and child development services, where we um, teach the nationally certified curriculum parents as teachers, so, um, and do a lot of outreach and work with families in our SUN system. So that's, that's also figuring out how to connect. I mean, the challenge that is gonna happen for us locally in the development of the hub and the coordinated service delivery system is to figure out how we take um, all of these efforts that are um, very diffuse across our community and knit them together to create a system where we can identify who are the kids and families who need supports to be successful and how do we get them to the right programming and services that meet their needs. And that's really the challenge that we have. The thing that I think is the strength in Multnomah County is that we have a couple of really great systems that are already in place that are doing a lot of work with exactly the the families that the governor is most interested in touching and reaching with this initiative. I talked about our son that schools uniting neighborhoods program where we're in 65 schools. I'm looking at Peggy 65, 67 schools um, in Multnomah County, which is over over 40% of the public schools in Multnomah County where we're doing that service. And that's a service that's really designed to try to address the needs of the whole family, not just the school age kids. We have um, a huge clinic network um, and as I said, nurse home visiting programs and other home visiting programs that are really touching a lot of families in our community. And then sometimes we forget to talk about it, but our libraries, um, reach a tremendous number of families through our story time program, our um, early um, years reading programs, um, and really helping parents to help their kids to learn to read. And in many communities, the library is the center of um, the universe for kids and families. So um, all of that uh, is stuff that's already going on here in Multnomah County and that we're already engaged in in a partnership with the state and local communities and our schools um, and many service providers. And the challenge is gonna be as this, um, these changes go forward, how we take all the goodness of that and knit it together into the new system that's gonna be happening. So there will be definitely more to come. Thank you. And I will be around for questions as we do the gallery walk. So anyone who has questions about the specifics of Multnomah County, let me know. Great. So if you could join me in giving Jada and Joanne a quick round of applause. <laughs> Much easier to do without a microphone and piece of paper in your hands. Quick note, this is going to be televised. Metro East Community Media will be showing it several times. We're gonna print out the schedule for when that's gonna happen. So you'll be able to watch it again, as well as the slides come into the Office of Citizen Involvement office, we will put them online. So if you're scrambling to keep up, there's multiple chances to, to review this information. At this point, I would like to introduce Lillian Shirley to give an overview of the county's role in the healthcare changes. Lillian is the director of the Multnomah County Health Department. She serves as the vice chair of the Oregon Health Policy Board, which is charged with overseeing health care reform in Oregon, and also serves on the Affordable Care Act Advisory Work Group in her free time, I guess. I don't know how it's possible. Uh, Lillian? Thank you. It's always really an honor uh, to speak with all of you from the community. Um, let me just clarify. There's really two things that are going on uh, in Multnomah County that affect our residents. And uh, I'm only going to talk about the first one, which is the coordinated care organizations and the work that a lot of the service delivery that people are familiar with that we provide will be engaged in. And the second one, and Sam, uh, Samantha, are you here? I can't, I don't see you, but um, we'll talk about um, the, the opportunity to expand healthcare coverage to, for people through the health insurance exchanges and what it might mean for people. So there's a lot of detail, and I just wanna encourage people um, to look at the resources that are on your page if you want more, and to contact anybody through the Office of Citizen Involvement, and we can follow up with you or groups that you represent on that. Okay. So with that, um, 
You know, I'm just going to step back and, you know, why are we doing this now? You know, we have a really great system uh, of care here in Multnomah County and that reaches out. But why now? Because costs are increasingly unaffordable and they're unaffordable to individuals and to the state and to businesses. And every dime that is not spent wisely uh, in that system of care is actually a dime that's being taken away from daycare and from education. So it's really important that we make sure that we keep people and we work to keep people together as a community as healthy as we can rather than have them uh, hospitalized. Uh, so the whole focus is prevention and uh, for citizens to be, you know, for residents to be empowered to take charge of their own health in their own communities. Um, the fiscal climate creates imperative and unique opportunity. Um, so the fiscal climate is the changes that you've noticed, and if you read the paper, um, we know that all of the people involved, both the hospitals and the health care plans and, and the people that you go to see your doctors, know that we can't just keep spending more and more money on this. And what's happening in Washington also impacts what happens in Salem, and that it impacts here. So there's an opportunity for everybody to say, well, we're not sure exactly what to do next, but we know we can't keep doing what we're doing now because it's too important. And it really pushed people in a way to come together uh, in a really concrete way. Um, and the other thing is, you know what? We don't really, we spend a lot of money. We spend more money than the rest of the world, and we get not so great outcomes. So with all of that money that we have, we should be able to spend it better and have healthier results for people. And there's also this lack of coordination uh, between physical, mental, and dental care. And you all know what that means. And, and particularly those of you who are parents who know that you may have you know, coverage, some kind of coverage for kids, but not dental coverage for kids. Uh, you might have to have, you might have to be your own case manager or your children's case manager because uh, the, the child's developmental therapist is in one institution, you're getting your care somewhere, the pediatric across the road, oh, and then you got to find a dentist, you know. So uh, it, that's kind of silly, and one of the things that we've known for a long time is, for instance, teeth are in your mouth, and your mouth is part of your body, and how, why can't we have people looking at our health from that holistic perspective? And I'll give you a, a really concrete example that, ha that has to do with how children come into the world. Um, we learned recently through research that, you know, we're, we we have a terrible problem of early deliveries of babies. And if a baby doesn't you know, stay with their mom uh, in uterus for as long as they're supposed to, they have trouble when they come into the world. And there's all kinds of issues that we worry about and put a lot of resources in. One of the main reasons women go into labor and babies come out early is because mom has dental infections, because the cavities is a portal. And there's been research just recently proven in the last five to 10 years. So the importance of making sure that every one of our uh, community members who are pregnant or are thinking about getting pregnant can get a dental exam is really not just about their dental teeth. It's about the future of children in the community as well. So we're beginning to get smart enough to figure out it's all connected. This is the focus of what we're all trying to do, and we call it the triple aim. And Oregon has recently done this triple aim. We've changed it to the quadruple aim. So if you look at, we want to have the best health for the best cost and also for the best patient experience. And what we've done here in Multnomah County particularly is we've added as a quadruple aim equity. We want to make sure that in all of our criteria, we're looking to make sure that not only does everybody uh, get the care that they need, but that we're really outreaching and making sure that communities, sub-communities in our jurisdiction, you know, have we that need particular attention around access, around issues around translations, around uh, issues around uh, family issues, that we know where they are and that we target our resources there. Okay. 
So this is kind of a busy slide, but it's kind of a one thing. If you take this home, you'll have like the, the overview. What are coordinated care organizations? Those are the things that the state said, you need to all come together, all of these people in our region, and you need to talk to each other, and you need to figure out what is best for each of the patients. So that we're not worried about, I just do teeth, or I just do mental health, or I just do, phys I just do adults between the ages of 24 and 36. Um, you know, but really come together and say, what are all of the things that we need to add together? And in this region, Multnomah County has been participating in the two um, coordinated care organizations that are here, and it includes probably all the hospitals you've ever heard of around here, uh, all the health plans that you've heard, you know, like Providence, Care Oregon, uh, Kaiser, uh, Tuolity out in Washington County, and, the, and also your county services. So we're kind of sitting around a table trying to say, if it's patient-centered, what is it that the patient needs? And there should be, you know, not that fragmentation, but somebody, the coordinated care organization, should be there to make sure that people can get that care that they need at the best place for them to go for the best services. <clears throat> um, can you just go back one? And then all of these things here are just aspects that we'll be trying to work on. For those of you here who take your services at Multnomah County, maybe you uh, go through our WIC services, et cetera, you know that we, we already have a lot of our service delivery on electronic health records. So that's one of the things that we're hoping, to integrate physical and behavioral health. Uh, and to use more, uh, outreach workers, community workers, navigators, to help people that you know might need a little more help to understand the system. Uh, maybe they're new uh, to our culture. Maybe they have language issues to make sure that people can get what they need when they need it in the appropriate place. So what will change, because I think that it's important to talk about you know, um, what is different about this. Well, the payment system will focus on quality and coordination and not clinic visits. Now, we're not there yet, but you know that when you go see your doctor, you have to go to see your doctor, and then you might have to come back the next day. Um, well, what we want to do is say that the important thing here is that um, it's about your health, and people will get paid for making sure that you are able to achieve the greatest health possible for you. So it's not about how many times you go see the doctor or how many tests they order, but to get into kind of um, a real uh, patient and provider dialogue around what are the best things that you need to do and to put a care plan around that for you and not so much depend on kind of one-off visits, one-off tests. Um, we do believe that there will be, and, and you'll be hearing from other people, that there really will be improved care coordination so that People will know who you are, and they'll know what you need, and when you go to where someplace else where you need it, they'll be able to know, what, before you get there, what you need and why you're there. So you don't have to keep telling people over and over again. Have you ever done one of those things, like if this person asks me my date of birth one more time? You know, it's like, you know, all I'm here to do is to, uh, to get my ear checked or something, you know. Um, and something else that will change, uh, all of the Multnomah County residents who are currently eligible for Medicaid, so that's 109,000, will be in this one CCO called HealthShare of Oregon or Family Care of Oregon. So we'll have that uh, culture that we can create together. There will be increased information sharing, so there'll be more holistic care, and there'll be more community collaboration. So we haven't, you know, we, it, this is a journey, you know, and what that will look like, we don't know, but we have a firm belief that that community collaboration will mean that the resources be between the tax dollars and the insurance dollars will really be spent better. And then just a last slide, 
what will stay the same? Uh, for those of you who uh, have been involved with Multnomah County and the Multnomah County Service Delivery System, uh, we'll continue to provide primary care, dental, school-based, and behavioral health services to vulnerable and underserved clients. Our care is provided through, you know this if you participate in it, award-winning patient-centered medical homes. We see over 70,000 clients, and the state has said that this care is the model of health care reform, this new model of care that we've been doing, the medical home. So people who have said, gee, well, will I have to go someplace else? Will my doctor change? No, we're, we have been on this journey, and what you ex have been experiencing and what your families have been experiencing is the path that we're on, and we, our hope is that it will only get better. Um, you'll see the same providers for the most part, and the county will continue to be the local public health authority as well as the local mental health authority. So we'll have that checks and balances with our uh, partners in the private sector. And um, our focus will remain on prevention, helping create healthy communities through our work that we've done with the schools and nutrition policy and physical activity, and of course, achieving health equity among all residents in Multnomah County. So with that, I'll turn it over uh, for the detail of the person who's putting it all together. <laughs> Wonderful. As you can see from the agenda, we have four speakers on the topic, so we'll have all four speak, and then we'll have the same Q&A session. And we are right on time. I saw you looking at your watches. I'd like to introduce Janet Meyer to describe how the coordinated care organizations will function. So Janet is the chief executive officer of HealthShare, the state's largest coordinated care organization, which will serve Oregon Health Plan enrollees in Clackamas, Multnomah, and Washington counties. Janet. So um, the good news is that I got to follow a very smart woman by the name of Lillian Shirley, and the bad news is that my presentation is very similar to Lillian Shirley. So um, it's, yeah, so we'll do it over again, and I, I'll have slightly different slides. And I do have a cartoon to start out with, which I get points for that, because Lillian didn't have a cartoon. So as you can see, there's President Obama saying no pressure, and, and Governor Kitzhaber performing his amazing surgery on our health system with everybody around there. We should add the counties and the cities on that one guy that's got state written on his um, scrubs. But that really is what's going on right now in the state of Oregon. The entire nation is watching us. And, um, <clears throat> and we believe we were the right state to get this assignment because we really do believe that the model we're building and the, the ideas that we're putting in place will actually achieve the kind of health reform that our nation needs. Um, so the next slide, so why health care reform, why now? Well, we can't afford it anymore. It's killing our economy, our private sector. Every dollar that the state puts into health care is a dollar that gets taken away from education, from community justice, from potholes, right? So we can't afford this anymore. Healthcare is also the leading cause of personal bankruptcy in the United States. So shame on us, right? We've got to do something here. So um, if food had risen at the same rate as medical costs have risen, um, a dozen eggs would now cost $80. A uh, dozen oranges would cost $107, and I eat a couple oranges a day. A pound of bananas would be $16, and a pound of coffee, $64. So that's the kind of inflation that healthcare has been gobbling up in our economy and taken away from other important uh, aspects of our lifestyle. So, uh, so what's a CCO? As Lillian was just saying, it's a network of all types of healthcare providers. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about that because uh, it's broader than healthcare providers. Technically, it is a network of healthcare providers who have agreed to work together. Today, we're working on Medicaid. The governor believes that this model is is the right model for other types of insurance, but right now we're focused on Medicaid. Um, we have one budget that grows at a fixed rate. Okay. I had a board member today arguing with me about mental health premiums. And I said, there's no mental health premiums in CCOs. Well, yes, there is. I said, no, there's one budget. We have one bucket of money, and we need to put it where it needs to go. It used to be that we had a fixed dollar for mental health, and that's what we spend on mental health. 
well, maybe we should be taking some money from over here and putting it over there. And that's what the governor did with his global budget, was he said, here's your money, go do good things with it. I'm watching you. So it's one budget, grows at a fixed rate. Um, we're now accountable for outcomes. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So we're not just paying for visits. We're paying for the result of the visit. It may not even be a visit what we need. We may need something else. And then we're governed by a partnership of healthcare providers, community members, and stakeholders. These are not insurance companies. Insurance companies will never transform healthcare, and we know that. They haven't yet, and they won't. That's not what they're built for. This is a different kind of a company. So it can't be run like an insurance company. Do you have the same financial responsibilities? Yes, but you have more responsibilities because now we have people with their eyes on us, people like Steve Weiss, who's going to talk in a minute, who's a chair of our community advisory council. This is a different kind of a company. It feels very different. Um, so who is HealthShare, I think is the next slide. Yeah, who is HealthShare? We're the largest CCO in the state and one of two in the Tri-County region. And um, we have this amazing cast of founding members. It's like, it's like the rock stars of healthcare in our, in our business. You couldn't ask for a better crowd. We have all the major health systems, all three counties. We have community service providers like Central City Concern. We have Upstream Public Health is on our board. I mean, it's really exciting. And these people show up, and they work hard at this. And they, they pay attention. They've invested a lot in it. So we're very lucky. So what's different about CCOs? Um, well, let's see. Global budget, flexible benefits. Now, the flexible benefit part is still being defined. Right? You've all heard Governor Kitzhaber talk about the air conditioner. We're going to go out and buy air conditioners for people that need them, right? Well, we haven't actually figured out how we're going to do that. Uh, the federal government's still trying to define that. Excuse me. Still trying to define that. So they're, they're saying, you can buy an air conditioner, but not right now. We need to get this figured out. So we're still working on flexible benefits. It is provider driven. There's a larger provider voice at HealthShare than has been in any other um, program I've worked in in healthcare. Non-traditional health workers, this is another really exciting area because at HealthShare, we got a grant, a $17 million federal grant that allowed us to go out and experiment with non-traditional health workers while the rest of the state is trying to sort out what this means. So a non-traditional health worker is, is not somebody that has necessarily has a license. They may come from a culturally specific community. They may provide different kinds of services. You can have a non-traditional health worker that might go to, the, to WinCo with a family that's recently immigrated. You can have all sorts of services delivered by non-traditional health workers. Our mental health and addictions uh, professionals know very well the power of peer support. This is now what we're going to be allowed to pay for in Medicaid. So this is about doing what we know works and stop doing what we know doesn't work. It's pretty exciting. Having said that, the federal government hasn't quite defined <laughs> what this means. So we're still waiting for some more regulations, but we're getting close. So it's exciting. Um, much bigger focus on cultural competency. We're being held accountable for disparities in health status. You know, people with serious and persistent mental illness die 25 years earlier than they should, simply because they have serious and persistent mental illness. We can't do that anymore as a society. We owe more. Um, pay for value, pay for outcomes. Lillian talked about that. Let's pay to keep people healthy. Uh, combining physical, mental health addictions, and very soon dental. About one more year before HealthShare includes dental. Uh, more transparency. We're not only being graded publicly and, and um, having to uh, be measured in all these ways we've never been measured before, uh, but we are having community advisory councils who very much are engaged in our process. And large boards, we have a 20-member board, amazing group of professionals that are showing up for the job because they believe we can do better for this vulnerable population. So it's pretty exciting. What's the same? Uh, the basic benefit package hasn't changed, although air conditioners are soon to be coming. Um, the eligibility requirements have not changed until January 2014, which I think there's somebody here on the exchange topic later. We'll get a, hopefully get an expansion population. And the basic providers haven't changed. And that's one thing I would like to stop for a minute to say. 
When we talk about providers and CCOs, we're no longer just talking about physicians, physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, dentists, mental health professionals, right? Now we're talking about how do we partner with community service providers in a different way that's much more meaningful. So now we're actually picking up the phone and talking with domestic violence coalitions. How can we help our families be healthier? We're talking to the early learning uh, childhood councils about, um, we have a maternal child specialist in our office that talks about the before nine to five concept, which I think is pretty exciting, which is you've got to start working with the moms before they're pregnant, that's the before nine, and you have to keep supporting the families till the child is five. So oh, Medicaid is no longer about making sure a family, making sure a baby is delivered safely, it's now we're being charged with helping to launch a healthy family. That's a very different thing. And that is requiring us to talk to people that we didn't traditionally talk to because we were always very medical centered in Medicaid. It was always about the medical you know, protocols and benefits. Now it's about, hey, let's take that money and see how we can invest it for a vulnerable population and really do that whole rising tide lifts all boats kind of concept in our community. So when we talk about the same providers, physicians, hospitals, those people, yeah, same providers, but we're working with a whole new cast of characters uh, as well. So I think I close with uh, Lillian's call to action, which is um, the triple aim. We're trying to improve the lifelong health of all Oregonians. Um, increase the quality, reliability, and availability of care, and lower or contain the cost of care so it's affordable for everyone. So that's sort of health share and, and our CCO in, in the Tri-County area. Now I'd like to introduce somebody who was referenced just a moment ago, Steve Weiss, if you could come up here. Steve Weiss provides a community perspective on the healthcare changes. He is the chair of the Health Share of Oregon's Community Advisory Council. Steve, welcome. Thank you, Steve. Well, I haven't really prepared any remarks for tonight. I am not a professional. I am, as a matter of fact, among other things, an Oregon Health Plan recipient. And I, have been, I am an advocate. I've been doing advocacy in this town for over 17 years now. Why am I involved with Health Share? for a very simple reason. Um, HealthShare is all about, at this point in time, Medicaid. And the Oregon Health Plan is Oregon's Medicaid plan. And I am on Medicaid, and I am on Medicare. And um, the Oregon Health Plan and HealthShare um, will provide my, my care as a dual eligible, somebody for whom Medicare is their primary health care and Medicaid through the Oregon Health Plan is their secondary health care. But I'm, uh, I'm with HealthShare for um, several other reasons. Uh, right now, um, the health transformation process is what we have in regard to um, a Medicaid program in Oregon, and it will likely be so for the foreseeable future. I care very much about the Oregon Health Plan, and I care very much about its functioning as effectively as possible. As an, somebody who's been on the Oregon Health Plan since 1995, I have not always been satisfied with how those services have been delivered. So my bottom line in being involved with HealthShare is that at the least, HealthShare has to be an improvement and particularly and hopefully a significant improvement over the Oregon Health Plan that many of us have known from 1995 through last year. And so I am committed uh, in my role as health share, uh, with HealthShare to see that that occurs. Um, the community... Uh, when legislation was enacted creating the health transformation process and the CCOs, it included having uh, every CCO having a community advisory council. And in HealthShare, the chair of that community advisory council serves on the board of uh, HealthShare of Oregon, and I was appointed chair of the community advisory council, and I am serving on the board. Um, the legislation says that um, one member 
of the Community Advisory Council should serve on the board of all of the CCOs in Oregon, and that is uh, in fact occurring and has occurred. Um, I am for openness in this process. The Community Advisory Council meetings are open to the public. We have public comment for a half hour at every one of our meetings. The only time we're not open to the public is, is if we go into executive session and when we voted to open our meetings to the public, we included that proviso in our vote. But otherwise, our meetings are open to the public. We've been getting testimony mostly from providers. We badly need testimony from people on the Oregon Health Plan to tell us how the OHP is working for them and to also tell us how the changes that are being affected by health care affects their health care. And so I, I, I kind of want to send out a message to everyone here. If you've got friends on the Oregon Health Plan, please encourage them to come to our meetings. Um, our meetings are posted on HealthShare's website, which is, I believe, healthshareoregon.org. And uh, you can find them there. Um, I, I send out an email to lots of people uh, for each of our monthly meetings. But we do need more Oregon Health Plan recipients coming and giving public comment to us. Um, it is my fervent hope that this process results in the aims, uh, in, in the, the triple aim that we've talked about tonight, um, and that it really improves health care for all Oregon Health Plan recipients in the state. Thanks very much, and I'll be open to any questions you might have. I don't know if you do. We'll do questions for all of the moments. Fine. And Steve, you'll be you'll be here for the gallery walk as well. For the, the last half hour, you'll be here as well. Oh, yes. yes. So if you are interested in being a participant and heeding his call to action, then please track him down. Fourth and last, and just to catch you up to make sure we're all following along, we have one more speaker. Then we're going to do some Q and A, and then the gallery walk, which will allow you to stand up and stretch. So, last but certainly not least, is Samantha Shepard, and she's going to describe the future insurance marketplace and how to apply to participate. So Samantha works for Cover Oregon, Oregon Healthcare, and the Oregon's Healthcare Insurance Exchange, developing policy implementation solutions and outreach campaign strategies. Welcome, Samantha. Thank you. Thank you. I'm pretty loud, so we'll see if I actually need this. Um, again, I am Samantha Shepard. I work for Cover Oregon, which is Oregon Health Insurance Exchange. We actually don't have the word care in there. We do care, but the word care is not in there because we don't deliver care. We help people access health coverage. So Cover Oregon, uh, we're going to try this. Oh, it worked. There you go. Uh, so Cover Oregon was established in 2011 by our state legislature. And it was in response to the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Uh, we've been established as a public corporation, which means we're kind of like OHSU or the Port of Portland. Uh, we're not part of the Oregon Health Authority or the Insurance Division or the Department of Human Services, but we certainly have reporting requirements and oversight going on with the feds and the state. Again, there you go. So we are tasked with building one front door for health coverage. Our goal is to build a centralized marketplace online where folks, Oregonians, can go and access health coverage from the public market, that's Medicaid, CCOs, healthy kids, as well as the private market. So we are partnering with carriers as well as the Oregon Health Authority, our state Medicaid agency, to make sure we can have all plans offered that Oregonians are eligible for. Oh, that time. OK. Ah, it wants me to be closer. We all do. So our website will look something like this on October 1st. Right now, we're deep in the build. We aren't actually serving consumers yet. It takes a really long time to build all of the electronics and all the IT for us to talk to carriers, for us to talk to the state, for us to talk to the federal government, and all the other people we have to talk to to do this work. So we began developing our IT in late 2011, and we have been um, deep in that ever since. It's, it's amazing the things you can learn about a computer system over the course of a year when you're just an outreach organizer. 
So our website will look something like this on October 1st, and you can see there's silhouettes in the middle. It says individuals, families, employees, and employers. Those are the people we want to serve. Those are the Oregonians that we're targeting. You can also see that this is a really approachable look, isn't it? It looks kind of intuitive, it's welcoming, it's appealing, it's something that we want to use and we want to be part of. That's totally our goal. So for individuals and families that come in to cover Oregon on October 1st, they'll be able to enter their eligibility information. That's basically your household size and your income. And the screen will actually populate with options that are right for you. So think about it like you're on Expedia or you're on a Target website or you're on Best Buy and you're shopping for things. And you choose three Galaxy phones that you wanna compare and the screen pops up with information in a way that you can compare it. So you can look at oh, what's, how big is the gigabyte and how, what sizes do they have or what colors and things like that. It'll look like that online. So you'll actually be able to make those comparisons line by line in a really informative way. And all of the carriers and all of the plans that are available to you will be there. So you don't have to go to this website and this website and this website trying to compare the information. It's in one place. And we'll make sure that information is written in a clear and concise way. Now, it's still insurance, so it's always still going to be slightly complex, but we're going to do our darndest to make sure it's, appro it's approachable and understandable to everybody. So coming through Cover Oregon on October 1st, your coverage will begin on January 1st. And that's really important for people to hear that. We need some build up time since this is our first year and we have a lot of people to get in the system. So we're gonna start enrolling people on October 1st, but your coverage won't begin until January 1st. So that's important to make sure people know that. So coming into the Cover Oregon system, you will be able to access coordinated care organizations and healthy kids, Medicaid programs and CHIP. You'll also be able to access qualified health plans, which are the private market. And qualified health plans are something the Affordable Care Act define. These plans have, meant, have met this benchmark. They're going to provide this level of care, a little bit of security, so you can worry a little bit less about the fine print. So if you come in and you access Medicaid, it'll be the same prices or not prices that you pay now for Medicaid and CHIP. And if you come in and access a qualified health plan, you may be eligible for tax credits. So if you're not eligible for Medicaid, but you're making about $31,000 a year for a family of four, up to about $92,000 for a family of four, you may be eligible for subsidies, for tax credits to help you pay for your premium. And there's a lot of options on how you get that tax credit. You can divide it up over the course of the year, or you can take it at the end on your tax return. You can worry about that on October 1st. But know that you will be able to access some help with paying for that premium, which is great. And if you're on the low end of that, if you're at about 31000 for a family of four, you'll receive more subsidy, more tax credit than if you're at the higher end. So it's on a sliding scale. So I've already talked about the easy to compare. There's also quality grading. This is a cool thing. So over the next couple of years, we'll be able to build a lot of data and a lot of information about what Oregonians think about health carriers and plans and access to services and utilization and all those other important things. Working with CCOs and working with carriers will be able to gather a lot of information as well as working with consumers and doing a lot of cons customer satisfaction surveys. So over time, we can actually build grades for plans and for carriers about the service that people are providing, the access you're getting. In Multnomah County, it's not too hard to find a provider sometimes, but if you live in French Glen or John Day or Pendleton, it might be hard to find the provider you're looking for, and we can kind of narrow into there and see where people are getting the best access and the best care. For small employers, and let's define small employers, small employer is an, a business with less than 50 employees, they'll also be able to come into the exchange, into Cover Oregon, enter their eligibility information, basically telling us who is your staff, and what are you looking for, and how much do you want to contribute to your employees' plans for their, for their cost. And they can choose how many carriers and plans they want to offer. So right now, if you work for a small employer, you probably have one choice, maybe two choices. Maybe you have one carrier, but it's an HMO and a PPO, but you don't have much more choice than that. Employers will still be allowed to do that, but they may also choose to choose three or four carriers or three or four plans, things like that, so you have even more option, which is great. And then they will push off the, the, inf the uh, commu computer information they've entered and the employee will be able to log in and complete their enrollment processes on their end. And it won't cost the um, small employer any more money 
for them to choose more plans. So it's a good option for them to offer more choice. And they could see it as a little perk for their employees. I would. So getting your questions answered, as I said, it's still insurance and it's still coverage. So people are still gonna need help and people are still gonna have questions, especially as all this is happening at once and it's a little hectic. So we are definitely partnering with community-based organizations, community partners, as well as insurance agents to make sure we can get this work done. For many of you in the room, you might have children that are unhealthy kids, and you might have been helped by an application assister. That's a lot like what this is gonna look like. So somebody that can actually sit down with you as a small employer, or as a consumer, a family, an individual, and help you with the application. Help you gather any documentation you need, which with the new system, you should need less, which is great. Um, but help you gather anything you need, enter it in the system, and make sure you get to where you need to go. Insurance agents will still receive commission, just like they do today, but it doesn't cost you any more money to use an agent. It doesn't make your premium cost anymore. And community partners may receive a grant to do some outreach and do some enrollment, or they might be doing it because they have a business purpose, they're a health department or something like that that wants to do the work. We'll also have a customer service center, of course, but we're hoping that a lot of it happens in the field. Uh, so our timeline, I mentioned this earlier, October 1st, the website goes live, but you can certainly go there today. There's a lot of good information on there and a lot of good things you can start tracking, but the coverage will begin January 1st. To point it that way. So here is um, something that I know Janet and Rob wanted to make sure I brought up. On the Cover Oregon website, there is a calculator right now. If you go to the website, it's on the right-hand side. And you can actually open the calculator, put in your household information and your income as you expected to be in 2014, and you can see what your premium may cost. Now this is all projection, folks, but at least it'll give you an idea of where you may be and what tax credit you may be eligible for. So for now, I did say you can come to the website. You can see the calculator there over on the right. It's a second blue box down. Um, and you can see over on this side, the left, um, some things you can do today. So you can join the Cover Oregon website. You can sign up for our email newsletters. You can also attend one of our consumer advisory committee meetings. Um, there's, you can also stream them from home if you are into that. And you're welcome to provide t testimony at any point or any an input. We also have a contact us page on our website. So lots of ways to plug in and start getting the information, and I definitely hope you do. It's an exciting new world. We have a lot of change coming, and I think this is gonna streamline a lot of it for us. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to invite all of our healthcare transformation speakers to come back up, and if you could sit over here for the Q&A session. Let there be light, thank you. Hello. So again, quick reminder, there's probably gonna be a lot of questions. There's a chance to chat with all of these folks at the gallery walk. So if you have a question for now that is applicable to all, if you could ask it quickly like you did the first time, because you're a very well-behaved audience. I'm a social worker um, working with dialysis patients, and we have a number of patients who um, have both Medicare and Medicaid, and uh, fortunate or unfortunate that they get their Medicare early because of the um, dialysis disability where other disabled people may have to wait a couple years be between, you know, before they get theirs. In the last number of months, I've been trying to f find more information about this because we have some patients that are extremely high utilizers, and it isn't just for dialysis, but they go to the emergency room inappropriately, and, you know, I think people in the room, you know, know what those high utilizers do. I was told by a number of people that because the Medicare is primary insurance, that the CCOs um, can opt not to include those patients in because federal dollars are the first payer and Medicaid OHP is the second payer. Can you um, tell me if that's accurate? And we would certainly like to get some of our patients into um, the CCO to be able to have access to the services because our people on Medicare and Medicaid do not have access to a lot of mental health services that are so necessary with all the losses that they go through with their um, 
end stage renal disease and um, lifestyle changes, and they don't have access to dental care either. So that's a really technical question about end stage renal disease and Medicare primary and Medicaid secondary. Um, and I'd be happy to talk with you offline about how that program works. It is true that if you're on Medicare, you cannot be required to join a CCO. You have the right to stay on what is called open card or fee for service Medicaid. We in the CCO industry believe that it's good to be in a CCO because we can offer coordinated care. We can work closely with mental health and dental and addictions to help this clientele. But I think what you might be hearing is that you can't require somebody who has Medicare primary to join a CCO. And that's a federal law that Oregon cannot override at this time. We think. We'd like to see more of the Medicare primary clients in the, the Medicaid plans because we think we have something to offer. But it's the actual patients that can opt out? Yes. In fact, a Medicare primary patient can literally opt in and opt out on a daily basis. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want? Well, I don't have much to say about that. Um, I think CCOs can offer additional services to um, dual eligibles. Um, but I happen to support the carve out that currently exists. Um, and and uh, I'm part of a community that has supported that carve out for a good number of years. Um, but I understand the situation that you're describing. And I think giving folks the flexibility to go either way and perhaps trying to convince people that they might be able to get more services if they opted into a CCO is uh, certainly an option. So I really appreciate all the energy and the enthusiasm around creating this new system. And uh, under the heading of not reinventing the wheel, one of the things that I was looking at when you were talking about what's different about this system is the um, non-traditional healthcare workers and some of the holistic approaches. And I'm wondering how there is a difference between that and the existing community health worker program, and if in fact there's been some collaboration between the two. Yes, there has. That's not to, I mean, community health workers, non-traditional health workers are nothing new. We've been using them in many communities for many years. Um, what is new is our ability to pay for them. And what is new is our um, new state requirements around certifying who we're allowed to pay for. So I think it's acknowledging something that has already been in place. Again, it's can we do more of what works and do less of what doesn't work? Let's be responsible here. So, absolutely. Hi, I'm Janet Hawkins. I work with Multnomah County, and thank you, Samantha, and all the presenters. Could you tell us one more time about the expansion of Cover Oregon and this amazing opportunity to bring many more working individuals and families health care coverage? It's such a it's an astounding thing, and I'm sure there are people in this room that do not have health insurance or who are paying lot, you know, I heard, uh -huh, um, lots of monthly income going to health insurance premium and co-pays and all those kinds of things. Could you talk more about this future that's coming you know, in January? Through the fact that individuals are able to access the market? Yeah. Um, absolutely. So um, above Medicaid, uh, right now, if you are an individual or you don't have kids, but you're in a domestic partnership, it's very hard to access health coverage. I was an independent contractor when I was a campaign manager for a while, and I was spending easily, and I was you know, 26 years old and a healthy female, though I was in childbearing years. So I um, was paying easily $400 a month for health care, and that was without dental and without vision and without you know, the opportunity to go to a natural or a chiropractor or anything like that, for sure. And now you can come in on October 1st and be able to access that market. 
again, coverage begins January 1, gotta be careful. But, uh, but it is a whole new market and a whole new world. And I think simplifying it, when I was doing that work and I was getting um, individual coverage, it would take a good day or two to make all the phone calls to get the quotes and to get all the information and you know, lots of notes on little pieces of paper trying to make sense of, oh, well, they said premium on this site, but they said this word on this site, and what's cost sharing compared to a copay, and all of those being, things being really difficult. So I think, yes, absolutely. Um, individuals being able to enter that market, small employers having more choice is a huge change, and it's also going to create more access for that population that, you know, Medicaid's going to expand, we hope, but if you're at $40,000 a year and you have four kids, you're not eligible for Medicaid, but you're still having trouble, you know? And so taking one thing off the plate and making one thing a little bit easier, definitely a huge gain. <laughs> but I, what I want to, you know, before, without getting into too much detail, I also think it's very important that um, in the Affordable Care Act, there are for the first five years income subsidies. So if you're, if you if you make too much money to be eligible for Medicaid, but you know you st it's still really hard to buy insurance because this is going to be the commercial market. There is a whole series, uh, you know, and again you can go to the website and see how it's stratified. But you in different uh, income levels. The federal government will actually give the state of Oregon dollars to subsidize that. So if you're, you know, up to, you know, up to nine, you know, and it goes away in five years, but hopefully that'll also give us time in the state to make it all more affordable uh, across the board in terms of what it does cost to have insurance. So I think that's important too. You will, it'll be easier to buy it. Mm -hmm. It'll be there. You can see it. And if you, um, if you're a low wage worker or, you know, some people, you know, it's a couple of shifts, uh, you know, losing a couple of shifts a month or a week can make the difference between being able to do this or not. So you'll be able to get that subsidy. So I think that's just one thing I, I didn't hear. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sherry Wilmson. I actually work for the American Cancer Society. And one big population that I struggle with all the time, and I'm at OHSU, is folks that confront life-threatening disease and all of a sudden can't work, but not quite ready or on Social Security disability. And so they're not eligible for Medicaid. And then they're still un uninsured. And how is this going to help those folks who then are working, waiting if they are on Social Security disability for at least two years to get Medicare, how can that help them? They're uninsured, their income's gone. Um, you know, I work with families and single people all the time struggling with that. Well, that would be the exact person that I was just describing. You know, someone who would be eligible for the federal subsidies to purchase in, in the individual market. No, federal sub is, so if they have zero money, then they get 100% of the subsidy. They'll be eligible. They'll be, they'll be eligible, and if, since it's income, you know, rated, it's, it's like a lot of the other benefits. You know, if you, you know, if you have zero income, you don't pay co-pays and things like that. But it, so that's, that is someone who will be able to purchase and will be in that the highest tier, if you will, of subsidizing their whatever it costs to purchase the insurance. Does that make sense? Right, uh, of course, yeah, yeah. No, we've been waiting for this for a long time, yeah. Hi, um, I had a question about the role of nurses. It seemed to be a big omission. Uh, in the providers that were listed. And as a community health nurse with Multnomah County Health Department for the last 25 years, doing coordinated care, working and going out to homes with moms and babies and pregnant women, making sure, doing a lot of the things that are being promoted here, just want to see what the future is for the nurses and the roles of the nurses in case management and um, in this coordinated care system. It would be nice to be a little bit acknowledged, or at least know what the future holds 
for that? Are there going to be nurses or are there just going to be community health workers? Is there, you know, um, a lot of times people get those confused. Oh, I can't imagine how they could, but I will trust that they do. Um, so two, two thoughts on that. One is um, part of the task of, of the CCO and the governor's charge to reform health care is to do capacity building. And what we mean when we say capacity building is everybody needs to work to the top of their license. So we don't have a doctor doing what somebody with a lesser license can do, and we don't have a nurse doing stuff that somebody with no license could do. So trying to make sure that every person in the system is working to the, their biggest and highest level. So that's number one. So I think what you'll find is nurses actually rising back up into recognition that you know a plan of care needs to be done needs to be created by a licensed person that would be a nurse a community health worker may be able to execute on the pl care plan that a nurse has developed but we need to have the nurses role in doing those care plans so so there's capacity building and making sure everybody's working to the top of their license that's important the other thing is around uh, the flexible benefits and global funding so what we have now are opportunities to do to take Medicaid funds and do block grants with them. And again, getting us off of that, you have to go to see a doctor to, to get to have a visit to get your benefits covered. Maybe what we should be doing is giving block grants to the county to send the nurses into the mother's home and work with the mother in the home environment. Some of the CCOs around the state have already started doing that with um, tobacco cessation programs that they're funding at the county level. So we do actually get more flexible flexibility in our um, relationships with our various partners, including the county public health and, and so on. Did that answer at all? Lillian, and, and, yeah, I can just add to that. I mean, I think, for instance, uh, we can't bill in, in the system now Medicaid, for instance, even for uh, immunization and stuff, unless there's a doctor being seen and stuff. The kinds of work that we've uh, tried to pilot around group visits and things that, that are nurse-led, that's something that we can really develop in a much more robust way now. So. Right. So are we still going to be doing those things? I think you'll actually be, be doing more of those things. It's going to depend on the county. Some counties do direct service delivery, some don't. So CCO's relationships with the county that does direct service delivery is going to be different than our relationship with the county that doesn't do direct service delivery. So we have to be able, these are supposed to be community responsive programs. So for example, right now, our health share CCO is meeting with the local public health authority to pick up a, a, a community health improvement project. And in fact, the one we're talking about is the maternal child health and how we can deploy home visit nurses. And can the CCO fund some of that so that it doesn't have to come out of the county funds in order to expand home nurse visits for our population? Now, when we do that kind of program, we know that you're going to be seeing people that aren't on Medicaid. You'll be seeing uninsured clients. You might be seeing undocumented workers. I don't know who all you see. But they're not all going to be Medicaid clients. But that's OK, because on January 1, they're going to become Medicaid clients unless they're undocumented. Um, but you know, we, we recognize that we need to invest in infrastructure in the public health arena. And that's part of the the charge that Governor Kitzhopper gave us and that Lillian's in charge of implementing. When you say that, though, are the, in Multnomah County, at least, those undocumented clients are paid for? Just call them plus. I know some Right. But I don't want to... But, yeah, that's... In, in, in Multnomah County, that's true. In Washington County, it's not true. They don't have a Cal and Plus program in Washington well, County. Yeah, you are. So at this smart. point, I'd like to invite our other speakers back up <laughs> briefly, and not, not for any sort of Q&A. Just, just, I also want to uh, give a cue to our Metro East community media partners who will stop filming at this point. Camera's over there. That's interesting. There is an online survey, both in English and Spanish. You'll get information about that here. Remind our viewers at home that that graphic should be appearing about now. 
with that, I just wanted to bring the other speakers back up so that we could remind everybody of the who's who real quick. So if you could just say your name one more time and who you're with, or just wave from there. So we're going to do the gallery walk now. And again, our